A reading from Ruth, chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malone and Chilion. They were the Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malone and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. The word of the Lord. So what is your relationship with your in-laws like? I have heard many variations on this, some good, some bad, some ugly. In my family, it's the joke that if Marty and I ever split up, they would keep him, not me. We could all probably tell a cringeworthy story of in-laws, whether they're our own or a story we've borrowed from someone else, which is one of the reasons this story is so compelling to me. Ruth decides to go with her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to the land of Judah. We have no clue what Ruth's life was like before she married Naomi's son, or what her relationship with the son was even like. We can only assume that she's never been to Judah, and she has no idea what it's like there. On top of that, Ruth is a Moabite, not one of the Lord's chosen people. Would she even be accepted in this strange land as a foreigner? We can surmise that Ruth is a special kind of person. She chooses her mother-in-law, a strange land and a strange God over any familiar comforts of her own home and with no men to care for them. It's a bold choice. Now, don't get me wrong. Women are capable of, of the same things that men are. We can certainly travel on our own, make a living, set up house, but... Back in the time that Ruth and Naomi lived, a man was vital to your existence. Only men could own property, make money, provide resources. You get the picture. That's why Naomi tries to convince Ruth not to come with her. She has no way to provide for herself, let alone someone else. Can you imagine loving someone so much you chose to be with them, no matter what the consequences might be? How about this? 
Can you imagine a situation so terrifying that it's actually less scary to move to a strange land than to stay where you are? I ask you to picture this for me, and if it helps you to focus and close your eyes, you can go ahead and do so. I won't think you're napping. It's all right. Imagine your homeland is in distress. There's a war, and you are caught in the midst of violence. You are a young mother. You have a husband whom you've known since you were born, and you love him dearly. He says he must fight in this war and that his family will be taken care of by God. Your husband goes to fight, even though you beg him not to. You agree with the cause, but you just don't know how you could live without him. He dies in one of the first battles. Your husband's brothers decide that it is no longer safe for you in this country, and they send you away with your mother and father-in-law to flee the only place you've ever known so that you can be safe. Your husband is gone. You live with your in-laws and four small children in a tiny refugee camp trailer, and you fear every day for the family left behind fighting this war. If you close your eyes, open them. Up on the screen is a picture of the woman that I was talking about. Her name is Huda Kalaf. I found her story on the Washington Post in a site that they've dedicated to refugees, stories called Refuge. There will be a link to her story when my sermon gets posted as a video on the website. I recommend you look at it. It's powerful, compelling, heartbreaking. Huda is 31. That's my age. She's a widow of war and has been for four years. Her husband wouldn't listen to her pleas not to fight and was lost within the first month of civil unrest that started in 2001 against Syrian ruler Bashar al-Assad. She is one of millions who fled since the beginning of conflict. She's unique in her own story, but the same as millions in many respects. Many have fled because of danger, just like she did. And every story I've read about a Syrian refugee includes the death of at least one loved one due to travel, due to the war. Most are living in tiny spaces. They have the basics, but just barely. Some might call Huda lucky to have survived, to have shelter, to have food, but most of us in our fairly, fairly peaceful country could not begin to imagine what she or any of these refugees have gone through. The loss, the pain, the fear, the uncertainty. Such is the story of Naomi. She's in a new land. She loses first her husband and then her sons. She has no choice but to make the journey back to Bethlehem where, where only God knows what awaits her. And then Ruth steps in. She says, where you go, I go. She refuses logic in order to care for a loved one and ventures on this harrowing journey together. What causes people to take such a leap, I wonder? Could it be faith? God speaking to these people through the Holy Spirit? Not in a booming voice from a bush, but a quiet breeze that catches your hair. Not in words, but a feeling that tells you, go. I don't care how scary or strange it seems, you are to go with this loved one now. That's what Ruth does for Naomi. Journeys with her to see what the future, what God will bring. For Ruth and Naomi, things work out well. It's a short book in the Bible. I, I would recommend that you read it. It's, it's quick to get through, and you'll enjoy it. And for laughter and a little more insight into the story, you can read my blog that's on the website on the topic entitled, It Says What? And here's a picture of the refugee camps. You can see they all live in trailers, like, like uh, chipping crates. It's, it's a very... 
they're safe, but it's, it's not a great situation. And that's Huda there. Huda's in-laws are a lot like Ruth. Ruth and Naomi shared loss in their husbands. Huda and her in-laws lost a husband and son. I'm not sure that if I were grieving that I'd be able to reach out like that, to offer such unconditional love, but that's what Huda's family did. It's what Ruth did. Perhaps out of deep grief comes an even deeper understanding of love. I don't know why this conflict in Syria must go on, and it breaks my heart to read the stories of so many who feel they have no choice but to flee from their homes. And I'm heartbroken when I hear of people who come to this country for reasons of deep poverty, corrupt government, and a promise that things will be better. Is it always better when you get to the new place? I don't know. I look at the pictures of the refugee camps, hear stories of people as young as two years old dying on the journey out, and my heart breaks. I hear people who, in fear, do not want to welcome or accommodate people from other cultures who would rather those other people go somewhere else so our comfort is not interrupted. And my heart breaks even more. I think God's heart breaks in this too. God does not cause the conflict, the poverty, or corruption, but God is with the people who suffer as a result. Huda's husband said before he went to war, I will give my soul to my country and I will leave my children to God. His faith in God must have been so strong to trust that all would be well even if he didn't survive. I believe God is watching over Huda and her children. They are safe, sheltered, and fed. It's not a great living situation. It needs to be remedied soon, but they do have the opportunity to begin anew when the time comes. They are alive thanks to family, to love, to love that comes from God. And Ruth didn't know at the time, but her faith in God was strong. She loved Naomi so much, she wanted to go to a new land and a new God. How fortunate for her that this new God was the true God of Israel. This God saw the love that she gave and saw to it that Ruth would not only be taken care of, but become an ancestor to the Son of God. And that Son of God, Jesus, came to free us from our sin, to free us from the worry of eternal salvation so that we are free to follow the greatest commandments, loving God and loving our neighbors. So who is our neighbor? How will we show them love? Love is powerful. Real love can lead you on a scary journey, but we can trust that God is always there with us, grieving when we grieve, hurting when we hurt, and celebrating with us when we celebrate.